I was getting worried they're going to move my sermon to Thursday morning. <laughs> my name's Dean and Sarah from City Church in Tallahassee, Florida. I can't believe I'm up here, but I'm grateful to be. I believe there are two things which are true at the same time. It's a great honor and privilege in Southern Baptist life to preach the convention sermon. I am grateful for this opportunity and take it very seriously. What is also true, and I absolutely believe this, is that the sermons the pastors in this room are going to preach to their local churches this coming Sunday are of significantly greater importance than anything I'm going to say here this morning. It is the local church that is God's plan and design for disciples to be made and the Great Commission launched around the world. Our local churches should be our greatest priority. And the truth is we can also do so much more together than we can apart. And what an act of grace it is for God and his sovereignty and kindness to bring our local churches together in cooperation, united in the gospel of Jesus Christ, to go from our churches for our communities to our states, nation, North America, and the world. Regardless of what the cottage industry cynics claim, it is good to be a Southern Baptist. My text this morning is Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three, where the writer says this, therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. You see, the author of Hebrews is testifying on behalf of the believers of former days who have gone before us. They are highlighted in chapter 11. They're the ones who have already run and completed their races of faith. The saints of before testify to us on God's behalf, reminding us that he is good, that he is faithful, that he keeps his promises to his people, which are ultimately realized, fulfilled, and find their yes in Jesus Christ. Here in Indianapolis, just across the street each February, the NFL Combine takes place. Football nerds like myself, who probably need to get a life, eat it up, and actually spend time watching these football players not play in an actual game, but show how high they can jump and how fast they can run. I can feel my wife's eyes rolling at me from here. One of the annual events during the Combine fans pay attention to is the 40-yard dash where the athlete competing for his NFL future runs as fast as he can for 40 yards alone, not racing anyone or anything but the timer clock, trying to run the fastest 40-yard dash of his life in front of watching pro scouts from all 32 NFL teams. Running the 40 alone, as in not racing alongside someone, will almost always guarantee a slower time. Now, running with someone in the lane next to you causes you to have to keep up, and it pushes you to th all the way to the finish line. You don't look at them the entire race as the finish line is your focus, but quick glances at your peripheral vision. You know, you, they, you know that they are there running alongside you. And that knowledge and awareness of someone running alongside of you pushes you harder and faster than just you, yourself, and a timing clock ever could. The writer of Hebrews here in this text calls the believers to run their races, and in doing so reminds them and reminds us that they are not alone. Such a large cloud of witnesses, the author says, surrounds them and surrounds us. Their races are already completed, and their instruction, teachings, and yes, even mistakes, remind, encourage, and push us to run our race as well and to not get entangled by sin as the enemy is so committed to get us off track. The scripture also reminds us, thankfully, that we are not running a 40-yard dash. But rather, we are told in the text to run with endurance the race that lies before us. And praise God that that cloud cheers us on. How blessed are we as Southern Baptists to run in such a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us those who have held the line for the Bible, the truth of the gospel, and the priority of the Great Commission. 
My generation of pastors in the SBC was born on theological third base, and we are well aware we did not hit a triple. Thank you, those who have gone before. In that cloud, we see perhaps the greatest encouragement come from the call for us to remain convinced of every syllable of this book and refuse to be hindered in our race by compromising or departing from the scriptures while also never forgetting or neglecting the great commission call that we all share together. Our belief that the Bible is true fuels us to want to make sure every single person on the face of the earth has the opportunity to hear that salvation is found in no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. It is doctrine that fuels mission, and our cloud of witnesses runs alongside us, reminding us of that truth. We look to that great SBC cloud and see Basil Manley Jr., who wrote that if we are to be mighty in God's work, we must be mighty in God's word. E.Y. Mullins, for all Christians, there should be one authoritative source of religious truth and knowledge. To that source, they should look in all matters relating to doctrine, to polity, to the ordinance, to worship, and to Christian living, and that source is the Bible. A recent addition to the cloud, he went to be with the Lord last summer, and I definitely miss him, Michael Katz wrote that when believers use erasers, where the Bible uses permanent ink, we get blurred lines, blurred theology, and errant application. Southern Baptist Billy Graham, and you better believe he was Southern Baptist, said, I learned the importance of the Bible and came to believe with all my heart in its full inspiration. It became a sword in my hand to break open the hearts of men, to direct them where? To the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it is to Christ the cloud points us as we run our races together. We're to glance at the cloud running alongside of us, and yes, we we're reminded that they are flawed, all of them. In Hebrews 11, men like Moses and Samson and David are all just in need of the grace of God as we are. And that's the point. They went forward by faith. Because those witnesses are not just pointing us somewhere, but to someone and his name is Jesus Christ. It's in that great SBC cloud where we look and find W.A. Criswell, many of y'all have this line memorized, who preached that there is a scarlet thread that runs throughout the Bible, and it is the binding that holds the pages of scripture together. That great scarlet thread is redemption through Jesus Christ. Oh, we glance at them who have gone before the cloud, and we need them to help us run our race. We glance at them, but we gaze at Jesus Christ. Verse two says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, locked in, because he's the pioneer and he's the perfecter of our faith. Southern Baptist messengers and guests, Jesus is the point. And it is he who began a good work in us and who faithfully completes it for the glory of his name and the love of his bride. He is the pioneer, the author, the perfecter, and no flaw is ever found in him. But let us not miss what it actually means to focus on Christ. It's easy to say, hey, let's just focus on Jesus. It sounds cliche. And miss what the writer actually means in this context. Because here Jesus is not presented as a good luck charm or a moral teacher or an inspirational figure or a mascot or a social revolutionary. Here we see in verse two, for the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, a gaze at Christ, keeping our eyes on Jesus, it's continual, is to focus on the finished work of our Savior. Our eyes fix on Calvary, where he shed his blood and his substitutionary death in the place of sinners. Gospel centrality is not a fad. It is not tribal. It is where we look in all the scriptures to see where it is we fix our eyes. In that cloud, B.H. Carroll, and his parting words to his successor, Lee Scarborough, at Southwestern Seminary, said, Lee, keep the seminary lashed to the cross. We fix our eyes where the suffering servant endured the cross, despising the shame, where he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might have to become the righteousness of God. We look to the cross. We also look to the empty tomb where the one who died for our transgressions was raised for our justification. He ascended to heaven, and according to the second half of verse two, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our mediator, our intercessor. He is reigning and ruling, and one day will return to judge the living and the dead and make all things new. 
we fix our eyes on the name that is above every name. And his name is Jesus, his saving work, his lordship, his authority, and his word. We fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Adrian Rogers said, back to the cloud, the Bible is a supernatural, spiritual, sovereign, surviving, sustaining, supercharged book about my Savior. Herschel Hobbes, the Old Testament sounds a messianic hope. The gospel records Christ's incarnation. Acts relates his continuing work through the Holy Spirit. The epistles interpret his person and work, and Revelation proclaims his final triumph in glory. The cloud reminds us that it is all about Jesus. And therefore, we can be reassured that our co cooperative effort is worth it because the resurrected suffering servant is exactly the one he claimed to be. And because of that, we fix our gaze on him. We look to the cloud. We fix our eyes on Jesus. And verse 3 tells us we consider Christ. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Why? So that you won't grow weary and give up. What is the solution to not giving up? It is the cloud, and ultimately, it is Christ. Consider his work, his suffering, his substitutionary death in our place. Fix your eyes and consider Jesus. Now, to fail to do that, to fail to look to Christ, to not keep our eyes on him, is going to cause us to get off track, entangled, and fall out of our lane during the race and not run as well as we should. Ed Young Sr., who is not in the cloud, but still ministering and recently announced his retirement after faithfully pastoring Second Baptist in Houston for decades, in his SBC president's address in Houston, in 1993, preached a sermon called Side Streets, encouraging us not to get off the track. When we fail to fix on Jesus, the obvious answer is that we're going to look somewhere else. And the sad conclusion is going to be we're going to get entangled we're going to grow weary, and we're going to lose hope. And that takes place on the side streets. My wife and I were flying out of Tallahassee recently, 6 a.m. flight, that shouldn't exist, worst flight, worst flight in the world. And we're getting in line, and we go through, and we scan our phones, and we get on the jetway, and it's really backed up. There's like 30 people in line just standing there, so of course we're all just staring at our phones. I don't know what it is, and how we ever get there, but I'm not sure to this day why we can't get people on and off an airplane very fast. We're supposed to trust the science and you can't get somebody on an airplane. Troubles me, as you can tell. So we're standing there staring at our phones, all waiting in line, it's backed up to get on the plane, we're tired. I mean, everybody is staring at their phones. And someone from the ticket gate was trying to get through to get to the plane, to give something to the flight attendants or the pilot, I'm not really sure why they were doing it. But none of us are paying attention. We're all just looking at our phones and we hear this voice behind us, it's the gate agent, coming through and they're saying, step to the left please, step to the left please, step to the left please. And as we're looking at our phones, all of us, not even thinking about it, I never even saw the person, we just went like this, all of us, and step to the left, the person went right past us. Messengers and guests this morning, the world wants us to step to the theological left. And we must always be cautious, Southern Baptists, that it will never happen on our watch. It is such a temptation. Perhaps the sin that so easily entangles us in this era of Southern Baptist history is being so concerned about what others think about us, especially online. A side street warning to us is not to become enamored by what Joe Rigney calls the progressive gaze. We're this figurative progressive that for some reason we want so badly to see us as either cool or accepting or on the right side of history or not too conservative or definitely not one of those kind of Christians that Twitter and podcasts tell us about lingers on our shoulder. And we can so easily just step to the left as we stare at our phones to appease and press and get a thumbs up just for the moment. Do they think I'm too conservative? Do they see me as in the middle, third way enough? There are other things you may sweat, such as making sure you're not seen as a liberal by SBC hobby watchdog Twitter. The answer to this is not to move to an extra biblical right, but rather to stay on the faithful road of following Jesus, fixing our eyes on him, and submitting ourselves under the authority of his word. 
It is so easy to get entangled and start running down a side street, chasing clout rather than chasing Christ. Let it not be said of us. I want to be concerned with doing what is biblical, what is right, what is just, and ultimately what brings glory to our Lord Jesus Christ and propels his mission to the ends of the earth. I want to take God and his mission seriously and not myself. And there is zero chance I will do that unless my focus is on Jesus Christ. Our mission is to declare that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and declare his kingdom reign over all the earth. We are not red letter Christians. We are whole Bible Christians. To focus on Christ is to hold fast to his word, all of it, and to be urgent in his mission. The truth is we cannot hold to inerrancy and simultaneously be embarrassed by what the Bible says. We cannot. No wonder you are weary. No wonder I'm weary. The goalposts move weekly. I will always be chasing a side street to catch up with where they, whoever they are, claim I should be running. I believe that when we run our race rightly and faithfully, we will see health in two areas of our churches and our convention as a whole. Ray Ortland writes very well about this. And those two things are a strong gospel doctrine and a strong gospel culture. Strong gospel doctrine and strong gospel culture. Jesus fully embodied both. He was not 50-50. He was not halfway. He was fully both. It was Peter who wrote to us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we take side streets, we usually walk down one road, doctrine or culture, and away from another. When we run our race towards Jesus, we will see that strong, strong doctrine and healthy culture, which we could simply call truth and grace, are the exact same road. When I look across our cooperative effort, my personal opinion as I look across Southern Baptist life, I do not believe we have a gospel doctrine problem. By that I mean you won't find a seminary professor who believes Genesis is an allegorical fairy tale or a Send Network church planner who denies the exclusivity of Christ. Now we must always guard it, always guard it. Remembering that just because Manley Jr. drew up the abstract and principles in 1858 did not mean they were going to automatically abide by it teaching in the classroom in 1978. I am thankful we have trustees and leadership who ensure the doctrine in our cooperative effort, our cooperative effort of our institutions stays on the track, on the road of our race of faith, making sure we don't step to the left and get easily entangled. We must continue to stay in the lane of our race by never assuming and continue to believe that one has no business serving in one of our entities if you do not affirm our Baptist faith and message. It is a gospel doctrine issue, not aligning with what we believe, and a gospel culture issue of being divisive, as those who stray from the BFM are the ones who have moved. Doctrinally speaking, I'm a student of history. I was a little kid during the conservative resurgence. But doctrinally speaking, the moderates and progressives from the conservative resurgence era, sadly, and our approach should be the word sadly, have largely gone on to prove those who have gone before us right in their claims what was happening theologically in our convention at the time. Take one look at what used to be some of our Baptist-funded colleges in our states, what became of them in terms of doctrinally and socially, and you will see. It's undeniable. The Cooperative Baptist Fellowship lists the affirming network on its website, which, quote, will provide a safe space for new and emerging LGBTQ church leaders who seek mentoring and advice from seasoned pastors who are fully opening and affirming. On their website. And I don't say this proudly. They are who we thought they were. What we cannot let happen and please hear me clearly here, is what those same moderates and progressive claimed of our conservatives concerning our tactics and character and how eventually they will turn on each other because they have to fight to ultimately be proven right. We cannot let that happen.
our Presbyterian brother Carl Truman wrote that being prophetic does not mean triggering the libs. It means calling anyone and everyone to faith and repentance, no matter the social and political exigencies of the day. We might have the right gospel doctrine, but having the wrong gospel culture completely hinders our race. It causes us to grow weary. You wouldn't tolerate it at your church. Why do you tolerate it in your convention? It can make our doctrine a loud, clanging symbol. A negative gospel culture will make us weary and lead us to become bitter and lose hope. I mean, how can it not when there's constant infighting? I have to repent of bitterness and quarrelsome all the time. It, it does something to you. If Jesus is the point, and he actually really was full, not half and half, full of grace and truth, holding gospel doctrine and gospel culture side by side is not squishy third wayism. It is biblical Christianity. It is fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, those side streets of poor doctrine and poor culture wind up intersecting with each other as we see the horseshoe theory go to, into play where cynicism and wanting to preserve a narrative of decline, even rooting for it, rather than seeing and celebrating where God is working is far too normal in our discourse, regardless of tribes, sides, and camps. And at that horseshoe, it is so sad to see someone who has gone extreme, lost friendships, constantly fights, and seems so angry and bitter and asks, what happened to him? What happened to her? And here's the most common answer to that question. Well, 2016 and 2020, it ruined him. It changed her. Those times in our culture let us down side streets, off the focus race to falling off on gospel doctrine, where you have to give 15 disclaimers before calling homosexuality sinful, to appease the progressive gaze or gospel culture, where you're quick to discredit and slander good brothers and sisters because they aren't as red-pilled as you or didn't get red-pilled as fast as you or because they are red-pilled at all. Or maybe in your performance, which it often is, along the side streets, you always feel the need to punch right any chance you get to show people you aren't one of them. To claim that gospel culture is only a right side of the spectrum issue is to be completely dishonest. It's a problem, not just in this SBC, but throughout all evangelicalism, regardless of what tribe you're on. See, when we want to go after clout rather than Christ, it's always going to get off balance. Our goal in life is not to show someone we're not one of them, whoever one of them are. And our major stop along the side streets is declaring the wrong enemies. Your enemy is not in this room. Your enemy is not in this room. We must let go of what easily entangles us. And often it is resentment towards others masked as righteousness. The next generation of pastors, seminary students and church planters and missionaries don't want to be part of a fuzzy gospel doctrine or a lack of gospel culture. I am not really concerned about whether or not the world is watching. I'm much more concerned about if our own young people, the future, will think this effort is worth it. That's what I care about. That's what I'm sweating, literally right now. It does make you weary when a church member comes up and asks, why are we a part of this again? If you watch along online and podcasts and all the things, it's a fair question. But I'll tell you why we are part of this. We're part of this because of the cloud. We're part of this ultimately because of Christ, because of our great commission that we share together. My brothers and sisters, this is worth it because he and his mission are worth it. And even though God doesn't need the SBC, to accomplish his redemptive purposes around the world. He has allowed us by his hand and power to be the greatest missionary force when the race of faith is focused on Jesus and paved with gospel culture and gospel doctrine. 
That urgency we feel for the Great Commission must be a normal thing here again. Andy Armstrong said, what a glorious thing to be a co-laborer with God in winning the world for Christ. R.G. Lee pushed urgency in us, reminding us there would be payday someday. And Roy Fish in that great cloud told us we will either evangelize or we will fossilize. Arthur Flake, in his book, Building a Standard Sunday School, written in 1922, said the supreme business of Christianity is to win the lost to Christ. That's why we come together. That's why our IMB commissioning is the most exciting thing that happens here. That's why we get fired up about church planting and sending planters all across North America to take the good news of the gospel through the local church. That's why we care about what happens in our seminaries as we need new pastors going out to fill these pulpits all across the world. Bertha Smith in that great cloud, she said, I have praised the Lord for the privilege of being a single woman with the other person's sole need having first place in my heart. I will be willing to go through with just as much inconvenience, self-denial, and pain to see children born in the family of God as is necessary for a mother to endure for children to be born in the flesh. Goodness, gracious sakes alive. Hebrews, oh, that you won't grow weary and give up. The SBC is in a season of being weary. I'm thankful for light moments from up here, from Jay Atkins and Bard and others. Sometimes you can feel the tension in the room. We may have won the battle for the Bible, but let's not lose our joy on the side streets. If we're going to push hard about qualifications for pastors, let's believe the same inerrant Bible also tells us not to be easily quarrelsome. And I'll be the first to repent of that. I hope you will too. A cooperative effort as large as ours is going to have different factions and tribes and networks. That's unavoidable. And the reality is it can be a really good thing if we are locked on the path of Christ together running our race. There's going to be some, I was talking to my friend Nate Aiken about this over dinner, there's going to be some, their first in instinct is to think theologically about everything. There's going to be others who their first instinct is to think missionally about everything. That's not to say that those who think theologically first aren't missional, and that's not to say that those who think missionally first don't have a sound doctrine. But you know what it says to me? We need each other. The person who always wants to think theological first, kind of think tank kind of person, we need that person. The person who first thinks missionally always has the great commission, the lost on their mind, is so sensitive to that. Theological guy and missional guy, all of us are both. But emphasis-wise, they need each other to keep us running our race faithfully and on track. We can be united together as long as the path of Christ is our race to the finish line. Back to that cloud. Duke McCall, in a letter to Albert Moeller in 1993, said this, if you continue as president at Southern until age 65, you will break my record for length of tenure. Plan to do it. That will give you a time to get a lot done without having to hurry. Schools move slowly, but you have time to make Southern a place of intellectual piety where Christ is Lord and Holy Scripture determines the benchmarks. Roy, Honey, Roy Honeycutt and I will be cheering your cheering section, knowing that even Babe Ruth, using a sports analogy with Al Muller, it's fascinating, knowing that even Babe Ruth, even Babe Ruth missed a few hot pitches, but home run records were made to be broken. So pick your pitches and swing hard. We definitely miss pitches sometimes. The SBC batting average can be a little rough at times. I know I do. They say preach from your weakness and you'll never run out of material. Perhaps that's my sermon today. But messengers and guests, all who cooperate together in the SBC, let's keep swinging hard for the gospel. Let's swing hard for the nations. 
Let's swing hard to train more pastors. Let's swing hard for human dignity and the protection of the vulnerable. Those are not side streets, by the way. That is the way of Jesus Christ. Let's swing hard to see churches planted in college towns, major cities, and rural areas. Let's swing hard to ensure that we are faithful to what the cloud has entrusted us with. And let's keep running our race on the road that is paved with truth and grace that, after all, is the road of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are a grateful people to be called Southern Baptists. We acknowledge that you do not need us, but in your sovereignty and grace, you allow us to go forward in this cooperative effort of carrying your great commission to the ends of the earth. So I ask that we will be found faithful. Our Father, will you disarm this place and allow us to remember we need the reminder, we need the Spirit working in us that there are no enemies in this room, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I ask that we will not be people who give into the temptation to go off the path, off the race of faith, and drift. In either direction that is extra biblical, Lord, let us be found faithful on the path of following Jesus. Let Hebrews 12, 2 be a reality in our lives. We will fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I ask the rest of this morning and today, you keep the enemy out of this place. Lord, that we will be a people who cooperate for what is good, what is right, what is just, what is true, as we take your gospel from our churches and our communities and our cities to our nation, to North America, and to the ends of the earth. Help us stay off the side streets, but also care about what you care about, the essential, non-negotiable truth of your word. We're grateful for it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. this time, the chair turns the gavel over, uh, back over to President C. Bart Barber to preside the rest of the day. God bless you. Great job, Casey. Thank you so much.